Hey, what's up guys and welcome back to my reading journey. Hope we're all on fire. And today we're going to continue as usual with Seneca's letters from a stoic. Letter 8. Seclusion. Do you bid me, you say, shun the throng and withdraw from man and be content with my own conscience? Where are the councils of your school, which, are, which order a man to die in the midst of active work? As to the course which I seem to you to be urging on you now, and then my object is shutting myself up and locking the door is to be able to help the greater number. I never spend a day in idleness. I appropriate even a part of the night for study. I do not allow time to sleep, but yield to it when I must. And when my eyes are wearied, wearied with waking and ready for fall shut, I keep them at their task. I have withdrawn not only from man, but from affairs, especially from uh, my own affairs. I'm working for later generations, writing down some ideas they, that might be, may be of assistance to them. There are certain wholesome, wholesome counsels which may be compared to prescriptions of useful drugs. These I am putting into writing, for I have found them helpful in ministering to my to my own source, which, if not wholly cured, have at any rate ceased to spread. I point other men to the right path, which I have found late in life, when wearied, wearied, with wandering. I cry out to them, avoid whatever pleases the throng, avoid the gifts of chance. How before every good which chance brings to you in a spirit of doubt, doubt and fear. For it is the dumb animals and fish that are deceived by tempting hopes. Do you call these things the gifts of fortune? They are snares. <coughs> and any man among you who wishes to live a life of safety will avoid to the utmost of his power these limed twigs of her favor, by which we mortals must rash in this respect also are deceived. For we think that we hold them in our grasp, but they hold us in theirs. Such a career leads, uh, leads us into perceptuous ways, and life on such heights, heights ends in a fall. Moreover, we cannot even stand up against pros prosperity when she begins to drive us to leeward, nor can, nor can we go, da go down either with the ship at, la at least on her course or once for all. Fortune does not capsize us. She plunges our bows under under and dashes us on the rocks. Hold fast, then, to this sound and wholesome rule of life that you indulge the body only so far as it as is needful for good health. The body should be treated more rigorously. Rigorously, more rigorously, that it may be 
that it may not be disabident to the mind. <coughs> Eat merrily or to relieve your hunger. Drink merrily to quench your thirst. Dress merrily to keep out the cold. How's your how's yourself merrily as a protection against personal discomfort? It matters little whether the house be built of turf or of variously colored imported marble. Understand that a man is sheltered just as well by a vash thatch as by a roof of gold. Despite everything that useless, toil creates as an ornament and an object of, of beauty. And reflect that nothing except the soul is worth, worthy of wonder. For to the soul, if it be great, naught is great. <coughs> when I commune, in such terms with myself and with future generations, do you not think that I am doing more good than when I appear as counsel in court or stamp my seal upon a will or lend my assistance in the Senate by word of a, or action to a candidate? Believe me, those who seem to be boos boost boost be bo boss boss with nothing as bo boss boss it with the greater tasks they are dealing at the same time with things mortal and things immortal but I must stop and, and pay my customer a contribution to balance this letter. The payment shall not be made from my own property, for I am still conning Epicurus. I read today in his works the following sentence, If you would ensure real, real freedom, you must be the slave of philosophy. The man who submits and surrenders himself to her is not kept, kept waiting. He is emancipated on the spot. He is emancipated on the spot. For the, e for the very ser service of philosophy is freedom. It is likely that you will ask me why I quote so many of Epicurus noble words instead of words taken from our own school. But is there any reason why you should re regard them as saying of Epicurus and not common property? How many poets give forth, forth ideas that have been uttered or maybe uttered by philosophers. I need no touch upon the tra tragedians and our writers of national drama, for these last are also somewhat serious and stand halfway between comedy and tragedy. What a quantity of sagacious verses lie buried in the mime. How many Publilius's lines are worthy of being spoken by basking car clad basking cal clad ac actors as well as by wearers of the slipper. I shall quote one verse of his which concerns philosophy and particularly that phase of it which we were discussing a moment ago wherein he says that the gifts of chance 
are not to be regarded as part of our possessions. Still alien is whatever you have gained by coetting. Co coetting. I recall that you yourself express this idea much more happily and concisely. What chance has made yours is not really yours. A third, spoken by you still more happily, shall not be omitted. The good that could be given can be removed. I shall not charge this up to the expense account because I have given it to you from your own stock. Farewell. All right, guys. So we're going to continue with your letter nine, but tomorrow. And thank you for joining me today. See you tomorrow. Bye.